the British tornadoes are still trying to land at the Canadian airfield. Low on fuel, with the conditions getting worse. Turn right in 306, three miles from touchdown. You're not actually consciously thinking, hey, I'm doing an approaching bad weather. You're just thinking, I need to get this approach accurate. So if anything, I'm just concentrating uh, possibly a little more than I would do normally, uh, aware of the fact that there needs to be a good approach to get in that kind of weather. Two miles from touchdown. Stack above, guide band, and just wave descent. We're left in 304 on glide band. One mile from touchdown. The point you make the decision is at decision altitude, or slightly before if you've got a pair. Basically, you get to 200 feet AGL, and uh, if you haven't seen your required references at that point to make a safe approach and land, you overshoot. And uh, if you've got the fuel, you try it again. If you haven't, you divert. And it was just approaching that decision when I saw the references I required to land. That was very bad conditions. That was about the worst that you could make an approach and land in. I've made an approach and overshot in uh, weather, which is obviously a little bit worse because you overshoot because it's bad. But uh, that's about as bad as it could physically get and still get in. the worst weather I've seen to try and land in because of the severity of the conditions change so quickly. This is Benny Dome, right, isn't it? Snow is no problem. Cloud is no problem. Rain is no problem. Snow, cloud and rain all at the same time <laughs> all become a bit too much. It does get the heart beating and the brain concentrating a whole lot more if you don't see the ground until, say, 230 feet. Nice weather for the time of year. It even snowed in July one year. During Maple Flag, the Americans were doing a snowman on top of their, their F-15s. The von Richthofen Phantoms have also made it just. A little bit on the, on the shaky side, on the recovery, especially on the strange field, where you don't know how the controllers are. We don't care about the weather, often because in Germany we have, I think, the second worst weather, weather after you guys. On the way to cap, like I said, we're going to cap, and three airplanes passing around in the west. Haven't got time, OK? We've got a fight to do. We're short of fuel. You've got to be there, right? 10 mile trail, you took off in 10 mile trail. Well, I don't expect to see then is 25 mile trail. After every mission, there's the post-mortem, the debrief. This morning's flight commander is unhappy. On the cap, sorted out the 10 mile trail. Then we end up... His men failed to follow his pre-flight orders. Some flew too fast, too soon, running themselves short of fuel but fuel awareness, OK? If anybody had me, I'd know I wasn't aware of it in the whole story. Flight Lieutenant Taylor is also a squadron top gun, a qualified weapons instructor, setting the standards by which others fly. We have two qualified weapons instructors, a pilot and a navigator, and our basic remit to the squadron is keeping everybody on the squadron up to a high operational standard. The standards are set by the two QIs, so if we are lax and we're happy to let shoddy standards through, the whole squadron will appear shoddy and be unprofessional. So between the two of us, we assess and check and monitor the performance of everybody from the, uh, the boss through all the executive officers right down to the brand new guys who arrive on the squadron. There's two types of weapons instructor, to be honest. There's the ones that are just nasty and there are ones that will try to teach people properly rather than just beast them into it. Uh, and the two of us actually had a pact at the end of the course. We said, look, we are not going to be the horrible, well, what do you think is the answer, sort of weapons instructors. Another day, it was more out there, the Air Force had gone home early, you'd be sat at uh, Edmonton now, and I'd be V unhappy, I suppose, you just moderately V unhappy. We had a pact that we wouldn't do that, such that if we saw each other doing it, it was a fine of a bottle of gin. Uh, to the other person. The point I'm making is that, and I hope you go away and remember this for the rest of your airborne days, is if you're given a place to be at a time with a fuel, you don't carry on fighting just because you're having a good time. You have to stop. And the two of you involved, I don't expect that from an op crew, OK, to be so low on fuel, so quick, so early, knowing that you've still got to be somewhere 30 minutes away. Now, that really is a hard hit. If I had my yellow card, I'd be waving it around.
we haven't had to find each other. There's been a couple of close warnings of uh, a bit nasty in the debrief there because there's no point being nasty. You don't achieve anything. You alienate yourself. You make the other person hate you. And you think, well, what have I actually achieved out of that debrief? Nothing. Knowledge of what was meant to go on in flow time was even worse. Uh, okay. So it must be talking about the southern Overall, the whole story, there wasn't a great deal of SA being shown. Now, if you were except from Paddy, I'm prepared to believe it. We were... No, hang, no, hang on, don't, don't get on your high horse, OK? I'm saying that uh, it was a fairly easy story, and we didn't do as well as we could have done. Now, if that's not a fair comment, you can come and see me later, and I'll point out the error of my ways to you. But uh, don't do it again, people. I'm not having it, OK? If, if you go into a debrief and gaff off all the learning points and ignore them, there's no point in debriefing. You have to go and say, yeah, we didn't make a mess of that or we could have done it better. So uh, you've got to come back and you've got to be realistic about life. You can't go around saying, we are the best all the time. People didn't behave in a particularly uh, professional manner, I thought. And uh, as I'm responsible for them when they're flying, it uh, reflects on me. So they need a telling off and they got one. I hope they learn from it. The mood of the RAF flyers is sombre when they meet their German opponents to decide who lived and who died, who won their private war. Flight Lieutenant Taylor believes his men shot down two German phantoms for the loss of two of his five tornadoes. The, uh, the southern group were all dead. The northern group were all alive and we've killed two of you. That's how we see things. Okay. Not so, say the Luftwaffe. Their visual evidence claims all five tornadoes down and no phantoms hit. They have a secret weapon, an American AMRAAM missile, which took the RAF fighters out at long range. But the Maple flag does not have the electronic wizardry to confirm who shot whom and when. It's all done by eye, by trust, by the air crew who fly each mission. The problem perhaps with this exercise is that they don't have um, a big television pictorial view of who's flowed where, who's shot who, who's been targeted by who. Because then you can see who's going to be killed, who's not killed, when you've made mistakes. Well, we don't have the technology to actually say that this person's dead. It's on the honor system. And uh, so we have some basic rules they have to follow. And uh, there's very little discussion that goes on with it. And people don't lie. And uh, the IT here is to try and get the lessons learned out and people to be mad about what happens and admit if you've made a mistake. We didn't do as well as I uh, had hoped we did, how I thought we did at the time. I was a bit unaware of exactly how far they could shoot the missiles. But we've learned from that today. And the time I did die, I was unaware of, of the man who shot me. What? We did our best, we died. There's uh, nothing more we can do about it, really. It was uh, not a particularly successful mission for us. Missions that go very well um, only teach you that things went well. Uh, you learn most when things go wrong. Uh, we've learned more about the, the missile that we were that we're flying against, the AMRAAM missile, which is an American missile. And the safety ranges that we were using are good, but uh, need us to be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, and so we're, we're going to look at something completely different tomorrow. I guess we're going to have to give the Germans it today. But uh, this evening when we play the crud match, hopefully we'll get a little bit of revenge. <laughs> Crud is an airman's game, invented by the Americans. Two balls only are used, usually one red, one white, and there's a physical aspect as well. If you ever visit an American fighter station, they will always have a table dedicated to crud. Sometimes it'll be a small pool size table, sometimes it's a snooker table. The team will have six players, three lives each. A game can last anything from five minutes if we're playing the Americans to 45 minutes if we're playing the Germans. You've essentially got to keep an object ball moving by launching a white ball from the ends of the table alone. If you can allow the red ball to stop before your opponent actually manages to hit it, or you can pot the red ball, then you win a point. It is a very aggressive game. It's probably designed for fighter pilots, and uh, yes, I, uh, I don't like losing.
So uh, I always get very involved in crud tournaments. Did I see some charging there? No! no. amusing playing the Germans in the first round. They have very similar sense of humour, very similar attitude towards life. And uh, the, on the many occasions I've worked with them, I've always enjoyed it thoroughly. So it was quite amusing. I always knew it was going to be a good grab match against, uh, shall we say, traditional enemies. Referee is uh, very much uh, more inviolate than any other uh, competition you can imagine. I mean, if you go anywhere near the referee, knock him over, then um, uh, it's a, a, an instant penalty. So, uh, no, the referee's word is, is law. The RAF have even the honours. The Luftwaffe may have won the war today, but the British go through to the next round of the crud competition. Next, the dramas continue. With eight combat missions still to go, the top guns face the threat of bird strikes.